Praise God. Now, a few th- something that I want to do before we take an offering today, and of course in the month of January, uh, we really look at, um, we're looking at values of Global Harvest as a ministry. And one of the things I also uh, really want to do through the course of this month as we are able, one thing that we really do as a ministry is, is we don't just preach giving and generosity we practice it, amen, and we are a tithing church. We tithe to other ministries. And so I, I want to focus on, um, as God leads, ministries that we give to monthly or regularly, okay? And there are many, and we'll talk about that, but um, one of the ministries that we give to is Shores of Grace, and it's a ministry uh, run by Nick and Rachel, Rachel Billman. And uh, Nick and Rachel, uh, and Nick has actually been here. He was here, gosh, a, year, a little over a year ago, a year and a half ago, close to something like that, and uh, was here for the night. And, but my daughter Emily spent three weeks with the Billmans and Shores of Grace uh, this past summer. And so because she's been there, she's been on the ground, she sees what they do. I just want her to come and just take a couple of minutes and share about Shores of Grace and what we as a church body are giving into. Amen? So just very briefly, I'll share some of the, um, a few of the things they do practically. They do so much, it's incredible, and they have a huge grace for what they do. Um, But their main priority is to, and I got to participate in all of these things and all these types of outreaches that they did. Um, uh, But their main focus and the main heart of Shores of Grace is reaching prostitutes and girls that are forced into prostitution and don't have any uh, thing else that they can really do and are forced to live that life. And so what they do is they, they go out into a place called the Avenue where these girls advertise and get their business. And they go out, and some they've known for years, and they're still into prostitution. Some have been rescued out of it and actually are on staff at Shores or have been helped out of it to get uh, financially stable, to get good jobs so that they can actually raise their family. And uh, that's the problem is that they've had to be into pro- get into prostitution because that's the only way that, that they could uh, provide for their family. Um, but uh, they've done this for a long time, and that was one thing I actually didn't get to go and do. That's the one thing I didn't get to go do is go talk to those girls. Um, but that's what they do, and uh, that's one of their main priorities. Um, another thing that they do is they also have a children's home for girls, and they have up to 20 girls at a time in Brazil. Uh, they have up to 20 girls, and I got to go there and spend time with some of them. Um, and it's legitimate. It's very legal and uh, safe. That's not always the case. Um, and it's something we need here, and it's something Brazil really, really needs, and it just doesn't happen there. And what they're doing is they're rescuing some of these girls that have uh, been abused and not in the best families, and from babies to 18 uh, year olds. And so they have a children's home there for girls. But not only that, they also have an in between home. So when they actually can no longer take care of them, in uh, their children's home. They have an in-between to teach them how to live life and how to get a good job so they don't fall into um, a bad situation as what normally happens. And so they teach them how to live. They get them uh, jobs or uh, training them for the big test that gets you into a good college, and which is huge there. those are a few things. Another thing is uh, they also go out and do street church. And so they'll go out into the streets and they'll just uh, they'll play their guitar, they'll worship a little bit while, you know, they put a big mat down. And this was the first outreach I got to do. They put a big mat down to color and paint the girls' nails. They play soccer with some of the boys and, you know, just love and have relationship with these people who are living on the streets. And not doing great things and that's just where they've ended up and they don't have any friendship they don't have any love and so that's what they go and do they just do street church and they don't force anything on you they don't you know throw up in your face about you need to get saved they just go to love and have relationship with these people uh, that are 
just living on the streets and it's it's really heartbreaking um but they would have never probably known love if it wasn't for the Billmans going out and just loving them playing jump rope with them that's what I did there I just played jump rope with some of the kids and you know we pray a little bit if they wanted to and uh, God was so present and the angelic was so present there um and I just prayed that angels would come and stay with those uh, people when we couldn't do what we we couldn't just stay with them and help them and you want to give them a better life but I just pray that the angels would come and uh, protect them another thing that they did is uh, they do communities and so they'll go out to different communities just to build relationship again they'll do some where they basically have like a Sunday school what we would know as a Sunday school uh, type thing is what they do with the neighborhood kids um, they go into families' houses and pray for them and ask them if they need anything. They'll bring gifts sometimes. Um, and they just do many things like that, and it's all tied into relationship and expressing the Father's love uh, where they wouldn't have that. And so really they're transforming a nation by what they do, these everyday things that they just have. That's just in a week that they do every week they do these things and there's so much more uh, that they do and they train staff and they have like three ministry schools to help teach pe uh, other people to go out in the earth and do these types of things and so they're literally restructuring well, not literally figuratively restructuring the foundation of Brazil by doing these things and so and that doesn't happen if they don't get money <laughs> and that's why we support them Amen. So it's important, you know, if we're going to um, see nations changed. And, uh, of course, Brazil is a nation that is a, a degree of revival. And, um, and yet some of these, there still ha is a great need for transformation to happen. And if we're going to be people that um, stand against issues such as abortion and some of those things, we have to practically offer real solutions to people in need. It's not enough to say, well, abortion is wrong and it needs to be overturned. If we, as the body of Christ, are not willing to step in and make a difference. Right, and I hope you're convicted by that. Right, I am because we have to be people that practically meet those needs. And I appreciate Ray, Ray, Nick and Rachel and what they're doing in the nation of Brazil. I'm sure Nick will be back here another time. They actually have an office in Plano, Texas. And, uh, and they themselves are graduates, graduates of the um, Global Awakening School of Supernatural Ministry. And that's how we connected to them. And I actually met Nick on one of the trips that I went to on Brazil. And uh, so they're just doing a great thing. And that is one of the ministries that we as a church give to every month. Amen. And so you can know that part of what you're giving goes to that, that end. And we'll focus on some other ministries in the next weeks that we give to on a monthly or at least a regular basis. Amen. So at this time, let's take an offering. Let's all stand together. Uh, let's raise our gifts to the Lord. Let's raise our voices. Let's raise our faith as we make these declarations together. Heaven open, earth invaded, storehouses unlocked and miracles created. Dreams and visions, angelic visitations, declaration, impartation, and divine manifestations. Anointings, giftings, and calls, positions and promotions to go to the nations. Souls and more souls from every generation, saved and set free, carrying kingdom revival. Thank you, Father, that as I join my value system to yours, you will shower favor, blessing, and increase upon me. So I have more than enough to co-labor with heaven to see Jesus get his full reward. Hallelujah. Amen. So if you're giving this morning uh, by check or cash, you can bring that. And There's always the option. Uh, we live in a, a different time when many give online, and I know many of you do that but you can give online at globalharvestchurch.co. Amen. And we're just continually thankful for the Lord's faithfulness. Amen. We found that God's just really faithful as we 
uh, are become stewards of his resources. Amen. And, uh, and he just wants to entrust us with more and more. Praise God. So thank you for your giving today. Amen. So at this time, we're going to dismiss the kids to go to their program. Amen. And uh, the herd moves out. We have many, and they just keep coming. All right. Jennifer, she's going to have Valentine's Day weekend. Yeah, so soon. Four and a half if we're counting, right? And we are, right? Amen. Praise God. So God's good. Amen. And uh, we're just thankful for his faithfulness. And um, I'm just excited about what the Lord's doing, and we'll be uh, just sharing some further things in the day is ahead, uh, further events, uh, further ministries that are coming forth. Amen. Now, this morning I want to continue talking about our values as a ministry. Amen. And it's important to, to talk about values. Values are different than beliefs, right? Well, I gave the example earlier of, of abortion. You can, uh, uh, you can believe something, but if you have a value, you will live and die for it, right? You can say, oh, I believe abortion's wrong, but if your value is life, then you'll do things like take care of the orphan, right? Uh, you'll, you'll take care of people and women and families that have been abandoned, right? That, that's a value that you have. Well, one, one thing that you know if you value something Here's a good example. You'll spend money on it. If you value coffee, <laughs> you'll, you'll um, often go to Starbucks, right? And some that really value coffee say no. <laughs> some that value flavors and sugar say yes, right? <laughs> What's that? He just values money more than coffee, right? <laughs> But what are things that are values, things that, that you implement, things that you lay a foundation from? Amen. And so last week, there were two values that we talked about. Uh, we talked about um, the goodness of God. Right? That, you know, it, it talks about, and just to recap very quickly, but, uh, you know, in Hosea 3, 5, it says that people will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. Amen. Uh, you know, and now God is, God is just, uh, you know, there are judgments and those things, and, you know, we can talk about that, but I'm not. But ultimately, God is good, and it's his kindness that leads people to repentance. Amen. And, you know, just as Emily was sharing about what Shores of Grace is doing, uh, there's, they're demonstrating their kindness, the kindness of God. And so um, we talked last week about the goodness of God. We also talked about developing a culture of honor, right? That we learned that, that in, in a revival culture, one of the things that happens is that love of God increases, amen? We individually become burning ones, right? But there's the reality that love for one another also increases, right? And that many times moves of God have been shut down because of, of division, They've been shut down because maybe people get at odds with one another. And so we learn to, uh, in Romans 12, 10, it says to give preference to one another in love. Amen. And, and you have to, how many, and we talked about this last week, that's something you have to work at. Sometimes do you have to give preference to your spouse in love and you have to work towards that? Yeah, sometimes that's a challenge, isn't it? Right? Uh, but we all grow in that throughout our lives. And so we talked about a culture of honor and, and what that produces. Now, I want to look at least at the next two values. I have seven listed, so we'll probably finish this up next week in this series. But there are two values that I want to talk about today. And the first one that we're going to talk about is uh, the value of community and family. Amen. Amen. Those things are extremely important in the kingdom of God. Amen. And how many of you know, um, you know, we can talk, we touched on this a little bit when we talked about uh, a culture of honor. Because you can say, man, I'm a burning one. Man, I just love to worship God. 
I can worship God for hours. Man, I can just be in his presence. I can live on the mountaintop, but I hate my brother and my sister. That becomes a problem, doesn't it? We can all say we're burning ones until we get in relationship with one another. Right? Because how many of you know that um, <laughs> you, you, maturity doesn't happen without walking in fellowship with one another? It, it just doesn't. And, and God designed us to be a body. Right? And, you know, the heart needs the lungs. True, right? All of our, our body works together with the different systems and the different organs. And God produces something when we work together as a body. And, you know, there are a lot of believers who are very disconnected right now. Um, that, that is a hindrance. If you remove um, a liver from a body, what does it do? It's a disgusting picture, isn't it, right? Sorry to put that in your head, right? But the, not only does the liver die, the body is in serious crisis and will die as well, right? So, you know, those things are very, very necessary. Um, Nikki Gumbel, the, the gentleman who developed Alpha Course, which is a course that's being used throughout the world to, to bring people into discipleship, one of the th examples that he gave about the importance of community, the importance of being the church in a local body, is someone asked him one time, they said, well, is it really important to be part of a church? And, um, or they asked a gentleman that, and he, they were sitting in front of their fi uh, fireplace. And so um, the gentleman reached and pulled a burning, well, probably not with his hand, right? But he removed a burning coal out of the fire and he set it by himself. And what happened to it? It went out. Right? And, and that's the picture of the importance of us in the body of Christ. Is We can be burning ones, but what happens when many burning ones get together? Right? No, it, it, the fire, it, it keeps the fire burning. Right? It catches other things on fire. Right? Maybe things that are, aren't yet on fire get on fire when they get around other hot couples, right? Uh, community, fellowship, those things promote the flame and the fire. And I tell you, if you get a bunch of burning ones together, you know, we've heard this before, you don't have to advertise. People will come to a fire, right? They'll come. They'll come and see what's happening. In Azusa Street in history, there were times that, you know, flames were seen over that building where they met. And, you know, um, they weren't literal flames. Uh, the, you know, they called fire trucks and they'd come and they'd be like, oh, this isn't an earthly flame. But there was a glory and a presence as burning ones came together, right? When Charlie Shamp was here, um, at the beginning of last year, last February, one of the things he prophesied was, this is a place for hungry people. He said, hungry ones, come here. Right? And man, as a pastor, you love hearing that. Right? And it's true. You guys are hungry. You're burning for something. And, and so community and fellowship is an important core value. Now, um, you know, so to look at this, I want to look at Acts chapter 2. Okay, and uh, this is a familiar passage of Scripture, but you see, you know, when, when the Holy Spirit came and the church was birthed, it, it was more than, just, uh, more than just what we know of as the local church, but it was, it was in a new, um, it, it was a new society, a new kingdom community that was formed in the earth, amen. And um, the, the thing that's interesting, and, and, you know, I'm all for being politically active. I think we need to be politically active. I, I think we need to be very involved. I mean, we've, got short, we've heard the testimony of Shores of Grace that's bringing transformation to a nation, right? But we have to understand that kingdom values are always going to be in opposition to the earthly culture. They are. They're going to be in opposition to to the structures and the systems of the earth. And even the early church, they lived in complete opposition to 
the society and community at that time. Right? For example, at that time, you know, you have things like women with no rights in Rome. I mean, they, they didn't have many. But did you know it was different in the early church? In the kingdom, when they came in, and you, if you study history, you see how many women were actually leaders and deacons and apostles in the early church. Which was, there was a kingdom value that was coming forth that was in opposition to what earthly structure and society said. Amen. Now, now, do we bring transformation when we live our lives in such a way as community and family with kingdom values? Absolutely. Amen. There, there's something that starts changing when we model community and family. So let's look and see what the early church looked like. And these are, you know, you guys have heard me talk about things like the Antioch church and all those things. But before you become an Antioch church, before you become a place from which people go in and out, you become um, a family and a community, right? And so let's look at this in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42 and going through verse 47. It says, uh, of course, let's read verse 41 first, right? If you have an electronic Bible, I'll keep you on your toes. It says, so then those who had received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Suddenly, on the day of Pentecost, they have a megachurch, Right? And what do you do when suddenly, I mean, can you imagine what happened today if suddenly we had 3,000 people added to the church? Oh my goodness, we're, we're, not, we're not ready for that, right? You know, but, but this suddenly happened. And here's what it says, what this, this, this group looked like. And I love this because it talks about the things they were devoted to. So think about in your life, what are you devoted to? Devoted to your family, devoted to maybe your job, devoted to binging Netflix, um, devoted to shopping, devoted to hunting, whatever. But this is what the early church was devoted to. They were continually devoting themselves, first of all, to the apostles' teaching. Right? There was a, a devotion to that. Secondly, there was a devotion to fellowship. Now, fellowship, we kind of understand, but there's, a, there's a, even a greater dynamic than just getting together and hanging out, right? With, with fellowship, there's something of we're, we're giving our lives to one another, right? Now, even with that, obviously there are boundaries, okay? That's a different message, right? But, uh, you know, they were devoted to fellowship because how many of you know God, and we'll touch on this in a minute in our next point, but... God is building us into a temple and a habitation of his presence and his glory, right? We're living stones that are being built into that. Do you know, God's in process, right? Some of us, and I, I believe that there are certain things that Jesus has finished and they're done, but the church is actually still in process, right? And there won't be a full expression if living stones aren't built together, right, in a kingdom dynamic. So they were devoted to fellowship. Now, this next one, some of y'all have got down, let me just say, right? They were devoted to the breaking of bread. <laughs> they, they were devoted to having meals together. Right? Because, you know, I don't know about you, but isn't, isn't it fun to share a meal together? And, and that's in that part of our lives, because my dad is so funny, you know. Of course, we've been trying to get him to gain weight. I mean, he dropped like, what, how many pounds in the hospital the week he was there? Like five, six, seven pounds? You know, and I'm just like, you just need to hang around with me for a while. <laughs> He's like, they're feeding me three meals a day. And we're like, yeah, that's what people eat. <laughs> Some of us that are Lord of the Rings fans have first and second breakfast, right? <laughs> and a snack in between, right? That may be part of our problem. <laughs> but there, there's actually an element of family and community. You know, you know it, families, is it important to eat a meal together? 
man, that is so important. It's important to sit down, have a meal together at least once a day. Now, I know sometimes our schedules interfere with that, but um, put our cell phones in another room, turn off the TV. Uh oh, I'm meddling now. And everybody, cell phones, amen, TV. Oh my, right? Right? But, you know, some of the reasons I think that the family structure is being damaged is because we just don't have meals together anymore. Or they're on the run or through drive throughs and all that kind of stuff. And, but, you know, and I know you can't do every meal that, but man, there's something about family and community coming together and having a meal. And the early church did that. Now, some of us have got it down. Right? That's why we try to have church fellowships on a regular basis where we can all sit in fellowship and have a meal together. Right? The guys, we're going to do that again uh, you know, at the end of this month. We have some ladies' meetings and the talks and what we're working on and some youth meetings that we're working towards. Amen? But there's something about joining together and fellowshipping together. Now, the next one, they were devoted to what? To prayer. Right? There was a devotion to prayer. They, you know, if you're devoted to something, man, whew, you give attention to it. You know, you don't miss what's happening. Right? It's the same way with prayer. Right? How many of us are devoted to interceding for our community. How many of us are devoted, not just for that, how many of us are devoted to hearing what the Lord's saying every day? And beyond Elijah list. Right? Or the generic 2019 words that everybody puts out. Right? Those are great. I'm all for 2019 words, but we have to ask What's God saying to me? Because some of those words are so different than what God's saying to me and my family may be completely different from what he's saying to other people. Now, yes, there are corporate words, so don't get all twisted on that, right? But are we devoted to prayer? Right? And an element of prayer isn't just praying for situations and needs, though that's extremely important. Part of it is simply communion with the Lord. Are you guys loving the Bible app we're doing? Oh my gosh, is that great? Don't you love the videos? And if you haven't started yet, but you want to jump in, you can, right? You can still do it, and I, I love how it's set up. But uh, you know, and I love you know that it's more than just Bible reading. It's an element of God. We're communing with you as we read the Word. We're communing with you as we read and pray the Psalms. Anybody pray some of the psalms? Isn't it fantastic? Right? So we're devoted to prayer. Amen? And beyond that, here's what else that this family and this community look like. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Man, isn't it good that God's restoring something to the church? Don't you love that there's a sense of awe that he's restoring to the church? I love it when God does stuff that I absolutely could not do. When people get saved, when they get healed, when miracles start happening that they're flowing out of his presence, when unusual things happen that we're just like, God, there's a, whoa, God, there's a sense of awe because you're doing stuff that's blowing our mind. I, I love that. That was the fabric of the early church. Right? I, I, I want us to come to church with the, the expectation that really anything could happen. I really do. You know, I expect God to move. If a glory cloud floats through here, praise God. Right? I love that there's a, a sense of awe. Amen. And it continues on with, um, in verse 44, 
and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. Amen. Now, before I try to get you guys to all move to a commune together, everybody's like, hey, don't, don't, hand, don't hand out the Kool-Aid today, right? But there was, you got to understand what was happening here. People had come from all over. God suddenly moves, they get saved, and they don't go home. And suddenly you've got all these extra people at Jerusalem who come for the Feast of Pentecost, and they're like, God's just done something and we can't leave. So suddenly you've got people that have relocated, and they're like, what do we do? Well, as the Spirit led, you know, people started selling property to take care of the needs of others. All right? Now on top of that, Jesus had prophesied that in the next generation, Jerusalem would be destroyed. Did you know that happened 40 years later? Jerusalem was destroyed, right? Jesus prophesied about it in Matthew 24, right? So it was probably good business for some people to sell properties and give it away to care for the church. Now, I'm not telling you to do that today, right? Again, it was as the Holy Spirit led. The difference between, um, you know, kingdom dynamics like this is the leading of the Holy Spirit. When it's forced, it becomes socialism, so, hallelujah. And there's not blessing in it because we're forced to do it. All right, so enough about that. Um, said all things were, they shared and had all things in common. Verse 45, they begin selling their property and possessions when we're sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Verse 46, and day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. So you've got people who are meeting together and sharing. They're worshiping together daily. Oh my goodness, right? For some of us that are teachers here, it feels like that, doesn't it? Because we're having chapel almost every day together. I tell you, this building gets good use, right? We have people here almost every day, sometimes all day. I mean, tomorrow on Monday... We'll have people here from 7.30 in the morning till 9.30 to 10 o'clock at night because of all the activities that will go on in one day, right? But, uh, but they're worshiping together, not only in, in here. I think this is key. They were worshiping together corporately in the temple, but there were also meetings in homes and, and fellowship and small groups that were meeting together throughout the course of those times as well, Right? So moments like this are important. I, I tell you, one of the things I'm really feeling and hearing for this year, and it's, it's, it's a constant, but I believe especially in the first portion of the year, one of the things that God's really highlighting is discipleship. Right? That's what he's saying. And You know, as, as great as it is, even, even as a small church in a small field like this, there's elements of, you know, things that we can't do in moments that we can do in like a men's fellowship where a few weeks ago, Marshall gave a testimony, right? And we'll hear probably another testimony in the next men's fellowship. Are women getting together and doing whatever they do in their meetings? I don't know. <laughs> Jamie says cry or something, right? <laughs> you, are you going to cry at your next women's meeting? No, right. Unless the Spirit does it, right? Uh, but, you know, the, Monday nights when we're meeting in the supernatural school, times that youth are meeting together, right? There's those elements of, of meeting in large gatherings, but also from house to house and from group to group. Amen. Those are important elements of discipleship. They worship together daily. And, and, here, and here's a result in verse 47 of what was happening from these actions. They were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day, those who were being saved. Right? Out of this culture, out of this kingdom community that had been established in the earth, right? Um, people began to be drawn. They began to be drawn not only because of the fellowship and the community and the worship, but because of the teaching, because of the prayer, because of the sense of awe as signs and wonders were happening every day. Right? And, and that's a value that we have to have as the people of God. Amen. 
Now, uh, the second value we're going to talk about this morning, which is the fourth in my list, and this is so core, is the presence of God. Amen. The presence of God is a core value. We value the presence of God. right? And we expect deliverance, freedom, and miracles to flow out of His manifest presence. Now, God's omnipotent. We know that He's everywhere. We know that He's here, right? But there's something that happens. Is there a difference when we begin to come together and focus on Him? He manifests His presence, right? And in our senses or in our spirit, uh, we, we sense the presence of God coming in greater measure. Now, He's in us. Amen. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But there's something about when we corporately come together. There's an anointing that comes when people come together corporately that's different. Right? And he manifests his presence. And so we value the presence of God. And and we just expect God to touch people. And as he manifests his presence, that people experience lasting change. Now, John 15, 5, I'm just going to read this quickly. Um, in John 15, 5, Jesus said, For apart from me, you can do nothing. Right? So the, one of our core values is absolutely the presence of God. Right? And, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, the aim of this gathering and when we gather together, and, I, you know, I want to I preach good sermons. I hope we have good worship. I hope we have good altar ministry. But I want God to show up. And if He doesn't show up, if He doesn't break through, if He doesn't manifest His presence, I walk away frustrated and disappointed. Because it really is all about Him. Our worship really is about Him. Right? Because our worship really isn't about entertainment. Now, if you're entertained, awesome. Our worship team did a great job this morning. Amen. And, uh, you know, but, you know, the vocals were good and they were enjoyable and all those things. But really, our, our focus in worship is on Him. Right? I, I, you know, at one point when we were worshiping, the Lord just said to me, just listen. Just listen and I'm going to let you hear the sound of heaven. I'm going to let you hear the roar of heaven. Right? I, I want to hear the roar of heaven, the sound of heaven, right? The, the sound of, that, of, of Jesus being enthroned in our worship, amen? And uh, it, we're devoted to the presence of God, you know? And the thing is, sometimes people want a little bit of presence. I want a whole lot of presence, right? I, I, you know, I don't want to be afraid of the Holy Spirit's intensity, Right? I don't want to be afraid of his intensity. I don't want to be afraid of the radical outpourings. Now, we're still going to have structure, right? Unless God just so comes that the structure goes out the window. Right? I want to read a, a Ruth Heflin quote. Right? Everybody know Ruth Heflin? Right? Uh, incredible lady that God used. She's since passed on to be with the Lord. But this is something that she said. And, and Jeremy Riddle um, tweeted this a few weeks ago. There's actually a few good things on Twitter. Um, <laughs> but he said, I kn- she, tw- quoting Ruth Heflin, I know that singing in the Spirit will become a great part of the coming revival. There will be whole services in which congregations will stand in the glory and worship in the Spirit. I'm going to read that again because it just, you feel the juice on that? <laughs> Let's marinate a little bit in this. She said, I know that singing in the Spirit will become a great part of the coming revival, and there will be whole services in which congregations will stand in the glory and worship in the Spirit. Right? Isn't that what happened in the Welsh revival? The Welsh revival was really about worship. And they just, the Holy Spirit would direct what, the singing and they'd, they'd sing for hours and, 
you know, one, one group would wear out. Of course, you know, sometimes when you're in the glory, things happen. It seems like things move really fast. But they'd be there for hours worshiping, and as they, one group had to go home and go to work or go to bed, there would be a next wave of people that would come in. And there was, it, it was marked by presence. You know, there was the, the story of the two kids that were overheard in the Welsh Revival, and they're like, well, one of them said, well, what's going on right now? And she said, don't you know? The other child said, Jesus is here now. Is there that tangible, manifest presence? And so, you know, and the thing is, we kind of got it backwards sometimes in the American church. Because to be successful and prosperous in ministry, what you do first is establish a foundation of presence. If you don't establish a foundation of presence, you'll never increase. Now, what we try to do instead is meet the needs of the people. Now, should we meet needs of people? Absolutely. Okay? That's a big element of the church, of meeting needs of people. But first and foremost, our foundation is presence. Right? And if we don't establish presence first, we'll never move forward. Right? And, and so that's what breaks through. Right? That's what causes a breakthrough is when everything flows from presence. Amen? And so, and, and my prayer is that everything we do flows out of presence. And that Ruth Heflin quote I read, Jeremy Riddle, when he quoted it, he said, I've seen this happen some, but I believe we're going to see more. And it was Jeremy, uh, uh, along with um, Stephanie Gretzinger, that were leading worship on one of the nights, one, it's happened multiple times that the glory cloud showed up at Bethel. Right? And, and, you know, if you hear Jeremy's interview with that, he said, I know what my gift can produce. He said, I know my gift can take us this high. And he said, and I was worshiping, and he said, honestly, he said, it wasn't a great worship set that night. And he said, I was struggling, and I was having a hard time. And he said, but then suddenly, he said, something changed in the room. And he said, I knew it was different than my gift. And that's when he realized, because he didn't know, the glory cloud was in the room. And God had just showed up. Isn't it funny that God showed up when he was doing a lousy job? Because, you know, sometimes we all get into this, well, it's all dependent on me. And, and there is an element that that's true, that our faith, our perseverance, our believing makes a difference. But sometimes just being present. Sometimes just being present and say, God, I'm here. My gifts got us this far, and God, it kind of stinks. <laughs> and God says, you know what, I love it. I love that you've just given yourself and you realize, and here I am. Right? Here's my glory. Well, just enjoy my glory for a while. Right? You know, it's not about your worship. It's not about the sermon. Right? It's about my glory. Right? And it's about presence. And, and we move. And that's why no matter what we do, we will always, always value the presence of God. You know, David was probably the clearest representation of the kingdom in the Old Testament. Right? Because David, what did David value first and foremost? Was the ark of the covenant. Because what does the ark represent? Everybody that grew up like me, they think the Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, ah, oh, melting faces, heads blowing up. Right, uh, it's a great movie. It's on Netflix right now, I think. But, uh, streaming. But, <laughs> but the Ark is about the presence and the glory of God. And David, 
who is this man of war, right? David was going to thump you if you messed with him. Let's go kill him, right? But, but David, this man of war, brought the tabernacle, set up the tabernacle around the ark and said, it's all about presence. It's all about presence. And he hired all these musicians and all these worshipers and he set them there and they worshiped day and night and their job was just to worship God. And the kingdom transitioned from a kingdom of warfare to a kingdom of glory. And you study what happens and what happened when Zion, the manifest presence of God, came into that region. All their battles began to cease. All their enemies were displaced to the point that Solomon's reign, now unfortunately Solomon messed up, but David laid a foundation that caused Jerusalem at that time, because of presence, to become perhaps the greatest kingdom that's ever been on the earth. And silver was so common it had no value. The queen of Sheba came to see what was happening because she'd heard the reports. And she came and she had no spirit left in her because she was overwhelmed with the glory and the prosperity that was on the earth. And where did it start? Presence. Started from one person. Started from one person who determined to worship God. So struck me this week as I've been reading through Genesis. And normally, sometimes Genesis is challenging, right? Oh my goodness. People were wicked then and they're wicked now, right? <laughs> but one thing that so struck me was one person shifted incredible things in the book of Genesis. God kept looking and he found Abraham and said, Abraham, man, I want to do this. If you'll just believe me. Abraham believed God. He trusted God. And through one man, through David, and David messed up so much. Right? They could do a reality show about his life and it would be worse than anything. Right? But he just kept worshiping God. And he kept his heart on God. And because of his devotion to presence, he shifted a nation. We're living today in what David broke into. He's looking for one. He's looking for one, that one coal who will set others on fire. Right? And it all flows out of presence. Amen. So we have to have, be people that host the presence of God. It's of the utmost importance. Now, you know, the reality is, you know, and again, we talk, I talked about this earlier. Moses said last week when we talked about the goodness of God, God said, I'll, I'll just send an angel with you guys into the promised land. And Moses was like, no. No, God, if you don't want to go, if you're not going to go with us, we're not going to go. We're not going to do it, God. Right? Because Moses understood that presence, that he valued the presence of God. Now, there is the reality that we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's read that real quick. Let's look to 1 Corinthians 6.19. I've already mentioned the fact that, that God's fashioning us into a temple of the Holy Spirit. But there is the reality that individually in our lives, we're an individual temple, but we're also being built into a corporate expression of the temple of God. Amen. 1 Corinthians 6.19. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? Famous, many of us have read the book, Reese Howell's Intercessor. Reese Howell's got saved in the time frame of the Welsh Revival. And um, 
we begin to hear about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Um, and the Lord told him, he said, basically, and I may preach about this further in a little bit, but the, the Lord told him, he said, I want to come into you, but if I come in, you have to go out. And, and, and the Spirit began to deal with him. He said, I want to come into you in greater measure. He said, I want to put to death some things in you. I may preach about that for a minute, you know. Put to death? What? God, you're, you're just going to fulfill my dreams and make my life good. Now, those are truths, right? <laughs> right? I'm, praise God for Joel Osteen. He's encouraging. Some days, I don't you need to be encouraged some days? But then there's also the reality of God wants to crucify things in our lives. And the Holy Spirit comes in in His power and, and, and He changes us and transforms us. And, and Holy Spirit doesn't come in just so we can give off a string of tongues. I prayed in tongues 40 years ago. Hadn't done it since then. Help us, Lord. But you're not your own. The Holy Spirit comes in in power. He transforms. Right? I, I'm, I'm getting off topic here, but this is all about presence. He, he baptizes us in His presence, not just so that we can have gifts, and I am pro-gift, and you guys know that, but He baptizes us and He empowers us, and we become witnesses that are empowered. And we're witnesses because we testify of a lifestyle and a kingdom that's now on the earth, and we walk in presence, and we release presence to those around us. We host Him. Right? Man, don't you want to host Him? Don't you want to host Him? So we have that value of presence. And then everything flows from that place of presence. And then you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Remember that, that this week. You're a temple of the Spirit. Wherever you go, I'm hosting Him. I'm hosting Him. I'm hosting Him on the job. I'm hosting Him in my home. Right Now that doesn't mean you have to be goofy. Oh, the, the glory of the Lord is on me. I'm going to scare everybody off. We're going to scare me off. right? But you're hosting Him. He's, he's wanting and the rivers of living water to flow out of you. And then everything flows from presence. Amen. And on top of that, we're, and let's let's go ahead and read this before we do communion. I've, I've made reference to it. But Ephesians chapter 2. Because I'm I pray this a lot in some of our gatherings. And but Ephesians 2, verses 21 and 22. Of course, he refers, Paul refers in verse 20 to the foundation of the apostles and prophets that the church is being built upon, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole body being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So we're individual temples but he's fashioning us into a temple of his presence and his glory, right? Just like living stones. Right? And sometimes, sometimes when you got to get a stone to fit, anybody ever done any brickwork here? You have to like just, yeah, form it, fashion it, shove it in. <laughs> but it's for a purpose. You're becoming corporate move of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, the values that we talked about today, community and family, and presence of God. Amen. Now,
let's move into a time of communion. Amen. And I, I just love that God just shows up as we celebrate the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. Amen. And, uh, and communion really is about presence. Right? It's really about coming together in His presence, celebrating what He's done, thanking Him for what He's done, and expecting Him to touch us in these moments. So I want to read out of 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse, 20, verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which He was betrayed took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So this morning, if you need healing, come to the table. This morning, if you need forgiveness of sin, come to the table. This morning, if you need empowering and grace to overcome, come to the table of the Lord. Amen. So Jesus, today, we thank you. Thank you that your, your table is a table of grace. And we just come to receive uh, healing, forgiveness, grace, mercy, restoration. Father, I thank you that you want to empower us and we just bless the elements of communion. We bless your table. Father, we bless uh, the body that was broken for us. We bless the blood that was spilled for us that established a new and greater covenant. And we come to partake of that today. Jesus, in obedience to you, just as you said in your last meal with your disciples, to observe this together. And so we observe this together. We celebrate and partake of what you've done today. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for this moment. And we receive today. We honor and we worship. Amen. So just come and partake. You guys know how we do it here. Just come and receive from these elements as Sean comes. Thank you, God. Thank you, God for your table, for your grace, for your mercy and your goodness. We just receive today what you're pouring out. Thank you, God. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your glory today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Isn't God good? Amen. So, uh, so blessings for the new year. Amen. School tomorrow, Supernatural School. Um, congratulations to Riley Joe. Many of you saw on Facebook, but who was accepted into Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. And so um, she'll be heading there in the fall to see if you made it. <laughs> so God's good, amen. So have a great day, have a great week, and we bless you guys. Amen? All right. And remember, ministry teams, uh, prophetic teams here and teams for physical healing here. So just come if you have a need and receive from those teams. Amen. Bless you guys.